here in your family, oh, maybe a brother, maybe a sister, maybe a nephew, a niece, an aunt or an uncle, and you went to the wedding, and you took your gift, and you went to the reception, and when you got to the reception, things were happening that you knew were not right, and you didn't belong I'll remind you of something. If you're a true, genuine, born-again believer and you get in the wrong place, the Holy Spirit will tell you. Amen. He will identify the place that you're in as being wrong for you as a Christian. A friend of mine whom I have had preach for me, him and his wife, before they got married, they danced every Saturday night. Every Saturday night they went to the place of the dance. And they danced and they swung and they had such a time. They got invited to a church service and the gentleman said to his wife, it won't hurt us to go. Let's go one time. So they got up on the Sunday morning after they'd had their dancing time and went to church. Sunday morning went by, the preaching was had, nothing happened. So there was a feeling in the heart of the gentleman that really he knew he needed the Lord. They went back on Sunday night, and he and his wife both walked the aisle together and got gloriously saved. The next Saturday night, he said to his wife, what do you want to do? She said, well, why change our habit? We've been going to the dance every Saturday night. Let's go to the dance. So they went to the dance. When they started to play the music, and the call was for people to get on the dance floor, he took a hold of his wife, and out on the dance floor they went. They took about four steps, and he stopped. And he said to his wife, I'm uncomfortable with this. She said, so am I. Let's get out of here. And he said, we never went to the dance again. God made a difference. You do it. When you have drawn near the wrong fire, as a child of God, the Holy Spirit will tell you, this place now belongs to Him. It is not your house anymore. You are not the boss. Did you hear me? He is. You begin to learn verses of Scripture like, Wine is a mocker, strong drink is raging. Whosoever is deceived thereby is not wise. Huh? That scripture never bothered you before, did it? Ephesians 5, 19, Be not drunk with wine, wherein is success, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. That's a command, by the way. But it didn't bother you before you were saved. I couldn't wait for the party. I couldn't wait for what I thought was the good time, what really was the bad time. I never woke up feeling good on Sunday morning. I never woke up feeling good on Saturday morning. I never woke up feeling good on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. I'm not proud of it. I'm sorry. But before I was saved, that was my life. I lived 24 hours a day, or whenever the waking time was mine, for the devil. I did everything he wanted me to do. Plus, I'm sure I did some things he didn't want me to do. Because he wanted me to be religious. Because that's how he likes to have you. He don't care if you're religious. He loves to have you go to church. Go whenever you want to go. Just don't get serious about this thing called salvation. Don't get serious about believing the Bible. Take your religion for what it is and plan on it to get you through. It'll get you through and into, but it won't get you through life with real rejoicing and it won't get you into heaven. It'll get you into hell. You see, the wrong fire produces the wrong fear. Proverbs 29, 25. The fear of man bringeth a snare, but whoso putteth his trust in the Lord shall be saved. 
The psalmist said in Psalms 27, 1 through 3, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. For whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked, even mine enemies and my foes, came upon me to eat up my flesh, they stumbled and fell. Though an host should encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war should rise against me, in this will I be confident. Then he goes back in thought to verse 1. The Lord is my light and my salvation. That's where my confidence comes. You see, the wrong fire produces the wrong fear. Look at it with Peter. Where is he at in the text? He's at the wrong fire. He's warming himself at the same, as himself at the same fire where the enemies of the Lord are located. You know, for the believer, it says in 2 Corinthians 6, beginning with along about verse number 13, that we're not to be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. I take great stock in those verses. I don't marry an unsaved person to a saved person. I won't do it. If the gentleman claims to be saved, the woman unsaved, or vice versa, the woman saved and the man unsaved, they come to me and say, Brother Osbert, well, would you marry us? I won't do it. And I got myself out of trouble many years ago because I made, a, I think, a good decision that I would not marry people who were not members of the church that I pastored. And that would keep me out of a lot of trouble. I have a pastor friend of mine who says, Man, I marry everybody. You get 50 bucks every time you do it. But I'm not interested in money. And I may be a little different, be a little strange, but when I marry uh, young couples in the church that I'm now pastor and they get married, they come to me and give me an envelope and say, we want you to have this. And I say, what are you talking about? I don't take money from people who are members of this church. I marry you for free. I feel like you're going to have enough battles after you get married, let alone paying the preacher too. Boy, you're all laughing about that. I think you've experienced some of that. <laughs> See, warming yourself at the wrong fire, being in the wrong place, produces the wrong fear. I know not the man. In Second Kings chapter 6, there's some wonderful scripture, beginning in verse 15 through 17. Now, we got to go back. I'll, I'll go back in your mind and look just a little bit. Before this, these particular verses come up, Elisha is now the prophet. Elijah has passed from off the scene. And Elisha now is the one who is the prophet in Elijah's place. And in uh, 2 Kings chapter 6, the king of Syria wants to defeat Israel. And so... What uh, Elisha does is God gets in contact with Elisha and says, please go tell the king of Israel, don't go by this place or that place because the king of Syria is waiting for him. So don't go there. So he goes in to the king and tells the king, don't go here, don't go there because the king of Syria is waiting for you and he's going to destroy you and go take over the nation of Israel. Don't go by that place. <coughs> So the king of Israel, with his warring factions, does not go by. The king of Assyria meets with his military might, brings them in and says, uh, I have a question. Which one of you is on Elisha's side? And a young man stands and says, I suppose he stands and says to the king, no one here is on his side, but let me tell you something. Uh, the prophet Elisha knows what goes on in your bedchamber. You're not going to keep anything from that man of God. So the king says, where is he? He says, he's down at Dothan. He said, take some soldiers and other things, go down there and fetch him to me. So they leave and they go down there. And they surround the city of Dothan where Elisha and his servant are. And the servant gets up early in the morning, the one who poured the water on the hands of Elisha, and he gets up to get ready for 
a good old-fashioned Bob Evans breakfast. Bacon and sausage and biscuits and gravy and... Oh, is it time to dismiss? Or perhaps lamb chops, huh? Or maybe a big glass of goat's milk. <laughs> but whatever it is, he gets up early in the morning to prepare the day for Elisha. And as he gets up and he walks out, he sees all them soldiers on every side. Horses and chariots and all that army of Syria. And he sees them all there. And he says to Elisha, my master... What shall we do? How shall we do? How are we going to capture this? But Elisha's not afraid. See, Elisha's on the right side. And so Elisha said to him, Fear not, for they that be with us are more than they that be with them. But he can't see that. Huh? You know, sometimes the servant does not have his eyes properly open. There are some times when even Christians can't see like they ought to see. There are some times when servants of the Lord make grave error in their judgments and in their conclusions because they have not looked into the whole situation. They've taken just the upper crust but haven't looked deep enough. So he couldn't see. So then Elisha said, Lord, open his eyes that he can see. Now that must have been something, wasn't it? Huh? He says, there they are, enemies. God puts his glasses on him. Wow! No discouragement now. I mean, God's got someone on your side, and it's Him. And He's your willing helper. The Lord is my strength and my helper. Of whom should I fear? Remember, I read it to you from Psalms 27. Why should I be afraid? The Lord's on my side. And sometimes we get overcome with what the world seems to say to us and think to us, and it isn't long until we have fallen for a situation that we have no business falling for. The wrong fire produces the wrong fear. The wrong fire promotes the wrong fervor. There's a, a warmth that is real when the Lord is attached to it. You know, there are some, in this world and its programs, there are some things that you got to remember about some fires of things that are passing away. There's fires of society that are dangerous. I'm careful about what I watch. I'm careful about who I listen to. I, I watch out for tele-evangelists. I'm careful and I warn my people. I warn them by name. Don't watch this rascal. All he is is coming into widows' houses and stealing their money. There are fires that we ought to stay away from and not consider as being the best for our lives. The fires of prosperity. How much money can I make? How much can I save? How good can my retirement be? The fires of prestige. I just want to be popular. Those fires that get us into trouble with the things of God and keep us away from Him. And then the wrong fire procures the wrong finish. Peter stops at the fire, fails to go the rest of the way in with John, which results in his pitiful proclamation in all three verses, 17, 25, 27. I don't know him. I am not one of his disciples. But there's a second thought. The second thought is this, the delight in discovering the right fire. Don't you like to be in the right place? There's a particular crowd of preachers that all of us 
run around with. I mean, I just like certain kinds of men who believe certain kinds of things. I'm not interested in joining hands with those who don't believe the Bible. When I first came to Ohio, it has always been everywhere I've gone. I get letters the first two or three months I'm there from the ministerial assassination want me to join. They want me to brown bag it once a month with somebody sitting across the table from me who's sucking on a cigar and blowing the smoke in my face. I don't take any pleasure in that. Or somebody who sits across the table from another church in the community who would say, I don't believe in the deity of Christ. I don't believe in it at all. I don't want to join around with that crowd. I don't have any good pleasure in being among them, to tell you the truth, because I believe the opposite of what they believe. So I have never gone. And in about four months, the letters quit, and I get no more invitation. Usually it's not just because of the period of time that I've been there that I haven't showed up, but they've heard something about me. So they don't invite me anymore. They say there's no sense in inviting him. He's not going to come anyhow. Now, I say to this speaker tonight, and I hope I don't sound cruel or crass or cold-hearted about it, but I, 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 don't, I just don't have good pleasure in running around with a tongue-stalking crowd. I really don't. We have a church in our area that runs about 3,000. It's a charismatic church. The man was arrested two or three times, two or three years ago, for flashing young girls, removing his outer clothing. But he got off because he had three crooked lawyers in his church who on technicalities got him set free. One lady that had the whole case sewn up, it would have been all right, but she couldn't remember the exact date and gave the wrong date for the day she saw him, and the judge threw it out because of a lawyer appeal to a technicality. About a month ago, stories began to float again. It was a little different this time. They caught him for drunk driving. It was Assembly of God, or charismatic, a tongues fella. And they caught him in the area where all the prostitutes hang out. And there he was going around and around and around the block. They believe now, of course, looking for an illicit kind of a lady. I wouldn't call her a lady. A woman. He said, preacher. And then he got up in the pulpit and said, people, please forgive me. But I want to remind you, I'm not God. I'm not Billy Graham. I, I, and he named, I'm not the Pope. So he said, you know, I'm just human. I'm going to do some of this stuff. And they it, it, it absolutely forgave him and took him in. And you know what he was celebrating the night he was caught for drunk driving? He was celebrating the writing of a new book on the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Now, you see, if I join hands with everybody, I have to join hands with that. I can't do that. I can't join hands with somebody who believes that you can get saved and lose it. I can't join hands with that. I can't join hands with people who ridicule the Lordship of Jesus Christ. I can't join hands with those who really don't, do not know what the Holy Spirit is all about. I want to get at the right fire. I want to be in the right place. I want to shout it out, glory to God, and go to heaven first class. Now, some things happen when you get at the right fire. Number one, you get a good look from the Savior. Luke 22, 16, 61. Peter said, Man, I know not what thou sayest. And immediately while he yet spake, the cock crew. And the Lord turned and looked upon Peter. And Peter remembered the word of the Lord. One thing about you and I, for sure, if you've been saved, God's not going to forget you. He's going to remember who you are. He's going to know where you are. It's His business to take care of you. 
And I say this to you kings. You're at the best time in your life. Don't do the wrong thing. Don't spill it over in worldliness. Amen. Don't get involved in the rock and roll of today. As I said the other night, the heavy metal. Don't do it. It'll destroy you. I had a friend of mine one time who said to me, you know, he said, Brother Rutherford, I, I wish I'd been like you. He said, I never had a drink of liquor in all my life. I never had a taste of beer in all my life. I never ever drank any wine. But he said, you've gone through all of that. You know the dangers of it. And I said, listen to me, Ray. You don't need one thing that I had. Not one thing that I had. You don't need it. You've had enough. It's enough to be lost. It's enough to know the Lord. You don't need the sin. You don't need the degradation. You don't need, you don't need the puff on a joint. You don't need it. It's time for you to be square, square shooter. All four square on the Word of God. Believe what you know you need to believe. When you get to the right fire, you get a right look from the Savior. And you get a reminding look. And then you have the right link to Jesus. Oh, when you get where you're supposed to be. The link is correct. You know who he is. You know what he did for you. You know this for yourself. The knowledge is personal, positional, perpetual, and provided. It is all according to the grace of God. I have a final question I want to ask you. What if you get the wrong fire? You're here tonight listening to the old preacher saying, well, he's from another generation. And you're right. We just don't believe what that old preacher believes. Why? Why? Give me a good explanation. Why? Has the Bible changed? Has the Lord Jesus Christ changed? Has the plan of salvation changed? No. The need to live a good life, has it changed? Don't we need today people who are pure in their activities? Isn't it high time we learn what real righteousness is all about? Isn't it right for people to practice a good moral in their life, always according to the Word of God? But if you get the wrong fire, so, supposing, and again, I'm not being critical, supposing you're in the wrong church. Supposing you're not where the Bible is preached. You never hear anything really about being born again where you go. You might get a little slight hint of it when some neo-evangelical comes in. To swindle the swindle message. You might get a little something then. But you know what? You need it more definite than that. You need it clear. You need something to touch your cold heart and to draw you to the Lord. You need the Word of God. And if you're at the wrong fire, I have good news for you tonight. Christ will forgive you. Amen. Amen. We can have the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of His grace, according to the blood that Jesus Christ shed on Calvary. That's where it all is. The cross by itself serves as a reminder of what happened there when Jesus died. But he's not there any longer. He's not laying in a tomb anymore. He's in heaven. And you only have one offering now to be accountable for, and that's the offering of the Lord Jesus Christ. For by one offering, we are sanctified forever. Amen. Set aside forever. God saves through Christ to the uttermost. All that will come unto God by Him, seeing He ever liveth to make intercession for them. You see, our God has given us a Savior who paid a penalty for our sin, who took His place in the grave, 
But in three days and three nights, he came out again. When he went into that tomb on Wednesday evening and came out on Sunday morning, oh, hallelujah. What a difference that time made. For if Jonah was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. You can't put him in on Friday and get him out on Sunday morning and have three days and three nights. But he did it for us. He did it to make forgiveness real. I tell you something. Christ will forgive you. I tell you something else. The saints will help you. I like the spirit of this gentleman back here while they were singing tonight. I know, I know, I no doubt about it. Amen. He lives in my heart. I'm going to shout it. Amen. Amen. Yes, sir. No doubt about it whatsoever. I know. See, that's good knowledge. The Apostle Paul had that kind of knowledge. Second Timothy 1.12. For I know whom I have believed, and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. Paul said, get in touch with the Savior makes a difference, and you can know, you can know the one that you've committed your life to. He's worthy. He has given you salvation. And boy, that's wonderful news because saints love to help other saints. Hmm? Now, we do it around our place, maybe a little different. When somebody comes forward and gets saved or gets something right, they give a little testimony about it, a lot of people are kind of huggers. We have them stand up in front, and folks come by and hug the neck, tell them they love them, they're going to be praying for them, going to do their best to help them. Well, you don't have to do it that way. That's just the way we do it. But what we are trying to say to those who come, we're here to help you. Now I'm give you a third thought. The Holy Spirit will compel you. You just get away from the Lord in little ways. And that right fighter that you were by will have a compelling interest in your heart. Amen. Well, I like to be at the right place. I like to be with the right people. Amen. For the glory of God, I want to be always at the right fire. But if you're not there, you can be. You can be. If you're not saved, you can be. It's not a matter of agonizing. It's just a matter of repenting and receiving by faith the Lord himself. That's it. That's it. Take your place as a sinner before God. Know yourself as lost. Be willing to repent of that lostness. Turn, go the other direction by being determined to do it. Trusting the Lord at the same time and He'll save you. And give you life. It's more than just getting people out of hell, it's getting people out of sin. It makes a difference. Heads are bowed and eyes are 